whose logos you can see on this slide. Um, this was a true group effort. So hand claps and thank you so much to everyone who participated in making this event possible. And uh, I'm gonna review our agenda. We'll have a few introductions before we get started. So you can see the agenda here on the screen. We will be starting with our first recording from our Baltimore School for the Arts students of the letter from a Birmingham jail. We will then have breakout rooms. We'll explain how that will work with such a big group and get some time to orient inward and react to what we've heard so far. We'll continue with our really illustrious, wonderful panel discussion. And then we'll sort of repeat that with the second part of the letter, a second panel discussion and a closing where we'll get to actually decide what kind of actions and outward facing, um, I guess actions I'll say again, we wanna take as a group. Um, I do also want to say, um, we'll put up our renaming slide in a moment. Uh, for those who maybe missed it at the beginning, please do be sure to put your names here. Add a star before your name if during our breakouts you wish to opt into the um, Jews of color and non-Jewish people of color affinity breakout group. And an X before your name if you will not be able to um, join a breakout room today, so we won't put you in one. And um, if you are using closed captioning or using uh, our sign language interpretation, please private message uh, Rachel Cutler and she will make sure to put you into the correct group and you can do that in the chat, just select Rachel Cutler. Finally, we recognize that this virtual medium is not perfect. Mm -hmm. We've all been in various Zooms for a couple of years. This free event is being organized primarily by volunteers such as myself, and we may have some technical hiccups as we go along. We appreciate your patience as we problem solve any technical issues that may arrive. Just one more thing on using Zoom, if you may or may not have been part of an event with closed captioning, um, you can toggle them on and off via the menu bar of Zoom. And if you have any technical issues or questions, please private message the tech support person for today, Molly Amster, and she will be very happy to help you out. Um, right now, I want to pause and acknowledge um, that we have a few people joining us today who um, are legislators and others. We would like to welcome Kirk Mitchell from County Executive Oswalski's office. Um, I see we have Sheldon Laskin here today. And um, please, Molly, let me know if there's anyone else I should acknowledge at this time. Uh, we're grateful, of course, for our legislators in joining us for this event. All right. Uh, a big thank you to our performers, Joseph Hatchett and Jaden Ozoamena. We are so grateful for these seniors from Baltimore School for the Arts in their theater program uh, who will be, uh, who have given us our pre-recorded performances for this evening. And uh, I would like to welcome, thank, and briefly introduce our panelists. We have Pastor Tara Huffman, Taylor Branch, and Trey Murphy, and Tracy Guy Decker from Baltimore Hebrew Congregation and another volunteer with JUFJ will be moderating our panel. We're going to kick off our event. Um, with an introduction from Rabbi Bush of Baltimore Hebrew Congregation. So I turn it to you. Thank you for joining us, Rabbi Bush. Uh, Laura, thank you. And thank you to everyone who are joining us. People are still coming in. We appreciate this day. I'm gonna begin my comments both uh, with, with something that the organizers appropriately asked me to talk about and that I think is in many of your minds. I'm simply gonna begin by, by sharing some comments that are about to go out to my congregation. Um, uh, we were reminded yesterday of what communal life is about on all its many levels. Frankly, it may have been an easier day for those amongst us who don't access media on Shabbat and thus we're not watching the extended hostage situation at a synagogue in Colleyville, Texas. We went to sleep 
relieved that the hostage situation at Congregation Beth Israel had been resolved and with all the hostages walking out safely. So let us now embrace the message that their, their rabbi, Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker, one of the hostages, expressed early this morning when he wrote, I am thankful and filled with appreciation for all the vigils and prayers and love and support, all the law enforcement and first responders who cared for us, all the security training that helped save us. I am grateful for my family. I am grateful for my congregational community, the Jewish community and the human community. I am grateful that we made it out and I am grateful to be alive. As Rabbi Sichuan Walker's congregation likely read during the serv their service, Baruch HaTadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Matir HaSurim, words blessing God who frees the captive. That, if you will, routine daily prayer takes on new renewed meaning this weekend. The rabbi reminds us that our words should be those of relief and appreciation for those who support and aid us. And we should never be looking for others to condemn in such a situation, nor be drawn into such condemnation. Inspired by this tone of what he said brings me to what I initially planned on saying this afternoon as we breathe a sigh of relief regarding Texas at the moment. When I am in Baltimore Hebrew congregation, which is not as often as it was pre-pandemic, which is a chance to note the terrible impact COVID continues to have on so many people, families, communities, our society and world as a whole. When I am there, I walk the hallway unavoidably outside my office to a list and photos of congregational accomplishments over the many decades since our founding. I note how one of my predecessors, Rabbi Murray Saltzman, served on the US Civil Rights Commission, marched with Dr. King, and was jailed with him in St. Augustine, along with other rabbis. Up the hall, I see a huge poster of his and my predecessor, Rabbi Morris Lieberman, along with the rabbis of many other synagogues gathered here today, actually. It is a photo of them getting arrested in support of civil rights, or as we would say today, doing the work of anti-racism here in Baltimore on July 4th, 1963. More important than the lone presence of those rabbis together is that they sit together with some other Christian clergy. For example, the late Reverend Marion Bascom, who I was honored to meet only one time in my tenure here. When I was new to town, Reverend Bascom spoke at a, ball, at a funeral at Baltimore Hebrew Congregation. But before he began speaking about his friend that he was there to mourn, he said, I cannot speak in Morris Lieberman's house without praising him, the rabbi, for his work in our broader community and his support. Now, I got to tell you, as then a relatively new rabbi to town, not new in my rabbinate, hearing my congregants praise our work against racism and in the civil rights movement, that was one thing. Hearing Reverend Baskin, this crucial black leader, respected minister in the community, amplify that praise, make it his own, that meant much more to me. And when I think of so much of our work in this cause, I found it interesting because I think often our role is to amplify the voices of others, not to amplify our own voices. And I understand the irony as I'm the one speaking at the moment. All of the clergy who have endeavored in this work at any moment, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or other, have done their task hand in hand with lay people, with non-clergy. Shall we say with the honest people who don't earn their living in their work, but rather are driven by morality and tradition to confront realities, build a better future, and help individuals. Actually, I think those Jewish groups gathered today to celebrate and respect the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. do so because we mean to amplify the work of those directly impacted and in personally struggling with the baggage bestowed upon this great country. And some of them, some of you are on all sides of that issue at the same time, amplifying, if you will, the, your own voices or hopefully feeling supported in that by your Jewish community and communities. This year, Dr. King's birthday yesterday, January 15th, fell on the same day that the Jewish lectionary cycle had us reading from Exodus of the actual moment of the Exodus of our ancestors. 
as we read Exodus 15, including words, words included in worship every day, we are reminded about our own redemption and that that redemption should not be something that happened once upon a time or only to us, but should propel us towards a future of working for others and not only for ourselves. The Reformed Jewish prayer book, Mishkan Defila, actually at this moment in the service, includes words adapted from the scholar Michael Walzer, right next to the words of Exodus 15. There is no way to get from here to there except by joining hands, marching together. Our ancient Torah, our continuing prayers, and the very letter we focus on today remind us that the work we do is not just about marching together, but engaging together Jews and non-Jews of color, together with those who are every part of society, working together not just to march or rally, but to build relationship and bridges across community and shared humanity. With all of this in mind, it occurs to me that Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail was indeed addressed to my fellow clergymen. We can forgive him the gendered language he was writing in 1963, the same year those clergy got arrested here at Gwyn Oak Park. However, he was trying to bring his fellow clergy and thus other congregational leaders along on a journey with him. He was losing his patience, understandably. In this historic and stirring letter, he included words that focuses the reader's attention on the law, on majorities, on minorities. Just to quote one short passage, he wrote, an unjust law is a code inflicted upon a minority, which that minority had no part in enacting or creating because it did not have the unhampered right to vote. Don't those words sink in this year in particular and across history. And so our overlapping traditions challenge us to focus attention on his words, as we will hear and reflect today. And they lead us to think about issue after issue, the laws, rights, limitations, and franchise to vote, and how they are intertwined. Just earlier this week at a steering committee meeting for the Baltimore Coalition for Dis the Dismantling of Racism, Baltimore's own Reverend Alvin Hathaway reminded me that Baltimore itself has a strong and deep history in the struggle for rights in this country. Our legacy of testing the laws of the land that Dr. King was talking about is as deep as the legacy of Birmingham or of Atlanta, just in our own way. And so we are good to gather together as community today, not just one community, but a set of smaller and interconnected communities from within the Jewish community. And we so appreciate others joining us as well. Mm -hmm clergy, and more importantly, those of you who are not clergy, as we gather, gather together to celebrate this day, to acknowledge the context in which it falls this year, and to learn and think and take action. With those thoughts in mind, let me thank the students from the Baltimore School of Arts who have put together the reading we will hear today. And now we shall hopefully enjoy, definitely enjoy, hopefully thoughtfully, part one of the letter. Thank you. Letter from the Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King Jr. Abridged for Baltimore Jewish Community MLK Celebration. While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the questions and criticisms that crossed my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill, and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Co Conference, an organization operating in every Southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. 
We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South, and one being in Alabama, Christian Movement for Human Rights. Whenever necessary and possible, we share staff, educational, and financial resource with, resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promises. So I am here, along with several members of my staff, because we were invited here. I am here because I have basic organizational ties here. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit here idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are, ca we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider. You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. I am sure that each of you would like to go beyond the superficial social analyst who looks merely at effects and does not grapple with the underlying causes. I would not hesitate to say that it is unfortunate that so-called demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham at this time. But I would say, in more emphatic terms, that it is even more unfortunate that the white power structure of this city left the Negro community with no other alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gang saying of the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record for police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of them, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in the good faith negotiation. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiation sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as the promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a moratorium on any type of demonstration. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs remained. As in so many experiences of the past, we were confronted with the blasted hopes and the dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. So, we had no alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. We were not unmindful of the difficulties involved, so we decided to go through a process of self-purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and repeatedly asked ourselves the questions. Are you able to accept blows without retaliating? And are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? We decided to set our direct action program around the Easter season, realizing that with the exception of Christmas, this was the largest shopping period of the year. 
knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of the direct action, we felt that this was the best time to bring pressure on the merchants for the needed changes. Then it occurred to us that the March election was ahead. So we speedily decided to postpone action until after election day. When we discovered that Mr. Connor was in the runoff, we decided again to postpone action so that the demonstration could not be used to cloud the issues. At this time, we agreed to begin our nonviolent witness the day after the runoff. One of the basic points in your statement is that our acts are untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this inquiry is that the new administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before it acts. We will be sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Mr. Boutwell will bring the millennium to Birmingham. While Mr. Boutwell is much more articulate and gentle than Mr. Connor, they are both segregationists, dedicated to the task of maintaining the status quo. The hope I see in Mr. Boutwell is that he will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to desegregation. But he will not see this without pressure from the devotees of civil rights. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in the civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture, but as Reynold Niebuhr has reminded us before, groups are more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. It has been a tranquilizing the milliide, relieving the emotional stress for a moment, only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. We must come to, to see with distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our God-given constitutional rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence, and we still creep at a horse and buggy pace towards the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim... When you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with punity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering, smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stampering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears swelling up in her little eyes when she has been told that fun town is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of infuriety begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness towards white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking in agonizing pathos, Dad, why do white people treat colored people so mean? 
when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept colored. When your first name becomes nigga and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John. And when your wife and your mother are never given the respected titles, Mrs. When you are harried day by day and haunted night by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoed stance, never knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There becomes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into a, an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, that you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. A big thank you um, in absentia to Jaden Ozoamena, our first reader. I am so moved by your rendition of these words um, and their prescience nearly 60 years later. Thank you again for your patience as we work through this. Yes, thank you all um, for your patience and thank you for those of you who took the time to sit with acknowledge your takeaways and your feelings from that first half of the letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, as Laura noted, I think we often skip over the heart work and then get stuck in the head or the hand when we engage with injustice. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Tracy Guy Decker, I'm the co-chair of BHC Justice at Baltimore Hebrew Congregation. And I am also the co-chair of the Baltimore Leadership Council for Jews United for Justice. Um, or JUFJ. And I am really delighted to be here with all of you and to serve as the moderator for this very talented panel in front of you. Um, a quick logistical note, if you do have questions for the panelists, you can send them via chat to uh, Evan Serpik, who has questions at the front of his name, and then he will get them to me. Um, I will be posing questions uh, from you all to the panelists if we have time. But first, I have some questions. Um, so I'm gonna actually start with uh, Trey Murphy. Um, Trey, as the co-founder of Organizing Black and the director of community organizing for NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, you have done your share of community organizing. Um, so with your community organizer hat on, Love to hear your reaction to this first half, this first selection from the letter. What, what resonates? What has changed about the need for or nature of community organizing? And what has stayed the same since Dr. King wrote this letter? Yes, first off, let me just say thank you uh, for inviting me and allowing me to be on this panel with these esteemed and brilliant people. I, I do not take it lightly especially as we commemorate the life and legacy of somebody who had a historic impact, right, um, on racial justice in this country, but also globally, right, uh, because we know that this struggle is oftentimes global. Um, my first initial reaction is that this letter was accurate then, and I think that it's accurate now in terms of some of the, like, pivotal contents that, uh, that was lifted up, right? So, you know, Dr. King talked about how if we are, if we allow our problems, to fester anywhere inside of this country in any community, it has an impact on every community. When I talk about racial justice, I oftentimes talk about the fact that we know that injustice happens outside of the black community, right? Like we know that that there are issues that that our society is grappling with. A lot of it stems from everything from the genocide of indigenous people inside of this country to, to this country's um, original sin around the profit off of uh, black labor, right, and the stealing of black bodies um, from, from the continent of Africa. So we know injustices happen outside of the black community. But what we also know to be true is that if we can help to fix the most marginalized, right, uh, if we are able to address the most marginalized issues, everybody wins. 
you know, the, this experimentation of democracy rests on our ability, substantive ability, I would argue, to be able to have a multiracial, multi-ethnic society where everyone is treated with the same humanity and basic dignity, right? Um, and that's what I felt like Dr. King's letter in this instance was saying, right? It was, it was saying that, that, the, that the public narrative, the public record is actually inaccurate, right? And that, and that the issues that we are faced with um, is one that must be rectified right now. And if we allow people, particularly people in positions of power or influence, as was the case uh, for the recipients of this letter, if we allow them to believe or think that, um, that they can simply, you know, agree with, um, with, the, with the central message of injustice, but not talk about the labor, the tough work, that has to go into rectifying that, right? Or if they can agree that there's an issue, but disagree with the tactics and they have put no skin in the game, right? Like all of those, those are those are particular issues. Um, so so that 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 would be sort of like the to me the broad base overview. There's a couple of excerpts that I pulled out from the letter personally, right? Um, and so when Dr. K uh, King particularly talked about how you know he is sorry, right? That that there is a statement of concern, right? For for the demonstrations that are taking place, um, but there is not the similar concern for the conditions, right? That are the reasons why the demonstrations are taking place. I still find that to be true today, right? And many people will will say that. Well, we know police brutality is an issue. We know voter suppression is an issue. We know that black people are still owed reparations, right? We know that that the vast majority of people who are living inside of poverty, there's still a racial inequity, right, when it comes to those percentages, right? People oftentimes say, Well, we we, we agree with those things, right? But then when we talk about the substance of what to do next, how to rectify, oftentimes that's where the misalignment, right, starts to happen. And so people will oftentimes be like, well, we know that there are these issues, right? But either it ain't directly affecting me, so and people can't see how it directly affects them. And so it's like, I got no skin in the game. Or people have an issue with the tactics that are being used, right, or, or deployed. Um, and, and the same, again, the same thing that was happening then is now happening now, where now we have to have this conversation around how should a person who is experiencing injustice actually react, right? What is the, what is the reaction to, to a black body being extrajudicially, you know, executed, right? What is, what is, how should one respond to that? How should one respond to this idea that people are not full citizens, right, inside of this country? What are those things? And so finally, I'll just say that, um, that, Oftentimes, I feel like the same fundamental questions that the civil rights movement was wrestling with then, we're wrestling with now, right? It really boils down to me two simple things. One is, what does it mean to actually be a full citizen, right, inside of this country? You know, like that, I feel like that was at the, at the heart of the, of the civil rights movement. You know, I would argue to say that we use progressive language, right? What does it mean to be a full community member, right? You know, because we understand saying that, that the term citizenship can, can be, um, it, can, it can be deteriorating and uh, disinclusive of, of people who are actual vibrant contributing members of our society, right? So what does it mean to be a full uh, community member, right? And what is the quality of life for those folks, right? And so there was a question for me during the civil rights movement, and I feel like for, for folks during that time, around if you are black inside of this country and you are born here, right? What does it mean for you to be a full community member of this country, right? What, what, what access do you have? Are you, do, are you guaranteed a right you know, to high quality education, right? What is, what is the civil line, right? And then the quality of all of those things, right? So those are the two central things that I felt like the civil rights movement was wrestling with then, and it's still true to me today that we are still wrestling with that now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Pastor Tara, I'm going to turn to you. Um, 
I know that with the when you were with the Open Society Institute, you helped determine which organizations receive funding. You always had an eye to educate um, the public. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Oh. Okay. Um, you always had an eye to educate the public and influence public opinion about the issues that were in your portfolio when you were at the Open Society. Um, and I know you're also a pastor and a lawyer, I believe. And so you have a lot of hats. You wear, all, you have a lot of lenses to apply um, when thinking about this. So I'd love to just get your reaction to the bit of the letter that we've just heard, to what Trey had to share. Um, what, what resonates, whether from your role as a change maker or a religious leader, both or other? Um, thank you for that uh, question and, and, and just, you know, wave at me if you're, if that feedback is still there and we'll try to figure out how to fix it. Um, so, um, whenever I read, um, Dr. King's letter, I am buked, <laughs> uh, which is a very black way of saying rebuked. Um, and I am constantly, it, it, it always centers me. Um, causes me to reflect um, up, upon my own role um, in the movement, my own place in the movement, and even my own attitude and that I'm having at that moment in time or in that season. Um, and um, like Trey, I, you know, this letter could have been written last night. And you're right, just change a couple of words, change a couple of dates. And, you know, Dr. King could have written this letter last night to his white brothers and sisters um, in Christ, um, you know, who he considers his fellow brothers and sisters, as well as to the white moderate, um, um, as well as to the African-American who's struggling for civil rights um, today. Um, as someone who was able to uh, resource movement, um, resource the struggle for civil rights and hu human rights um, in Baltimore City and even beyond, um, I too, was always struck um, and had to figure out how to navigate arguments that would come from internal to the organization that I worked with, just to be really frank, um, as well as external to the organization about the organizations we were choosing to fund and the tactics that those organizations used. Um, so people would be very careful not to take issue with the ultimate objective um, of what the movement said it was about, but so, but they where they would where they would um, aim the attack is at the method, right? Um, and I, I always, you know, I have to say that there were times where I was um, taken aback by that because as the person making the recommendation for funding, I then had to figure out like how to respond um, to that criticism and doing it in a way that you know would preserve my ability to still be able to move. Um, the money in a particular way, but it was also a very personal, I, I also took it as a very personal um, challenge um, about sort of what I believed, um, where I was positioned and sort of what I had uh, the right to say and to question and where I really felt like, you know what, even if that might not be my tactic and that might not be my method, this or I have to have faith and confidence that this organization has done an analysis and come to the conclusion that this is the right tactic, this is the right method, this is the right approach, given where they are in the movement, given what they understand um, about what's going on in the movement. And so, yeah, what I hear Dr. King pushing back against in his letter is, is exactly what um, we in very present day have to continue to push back against. People outside of the movement who are not being affected by the things that the movement is about, deigning to have an opinion <laughs> about how the ones who are fighting against the impression and the ones who are trying to tear it down are doing the work instead of getting in there and doing the work um, or at least having enough faith and confidence that um, you know and enough wisdom to understand that power concedes nothing without a demand and we are not going to tear down anti-black racism through negotiation alone um, there will be confrontation, there will be conflict, there will be threat to people's economic stand. I mean, there's gonna be political standing, there's gonna be all of these things. This is what movement is about. This is what struggle is about. It's what it's always been about. It's what it's always going to be about. 
And so you as an individual, as a professional, as a member of the clergy, whatever different positions and titles that you hold, you have to decide what is your comfort level and then do up to your comfort level. And then where you find yourself being uncomfortable, if you need to step back, step back, but don't become a stumbling block. Don't become a stumbling block to somebody else who is feeling called to, who has the boldness to go further. If you want to seek to understand, then by all means seek to understand, but do not seek to stop, do not seek to prevent, do not become a stumbling block. Just recognize that you may not be able to go as far as someone else does need, can and needs to go in the movement um, and let them do their thing. Thank you for your thing. Do what you do well, let others do what they do well. And that is how we get to the end, but don't become those white clergy in Birmingham in 1960s who tried to challenge what Dr. King and others were doing and prevent him from doing it um, by criticizing him in a very public way to which he felt like he had to have a public response. Thank you. That really is um, lands with me the way that you related the the way King was sort of saying like you say wait and you've never had to deal with this like you just laid that out for how that happens today and also gave us a great segue to my question um, for Taylor actually um, Taylor I was hoping that you could kind of sketch out the context, remind us of the context in which the letter was written, what was happening in Birmingham and what was happening around the U.S. in 1963 um, when King felt compelled to write this letter. Taylor, you're still, you're muted. I'd be glad to, and it goes to exactly what Trey and Tara were talking about, about how to move people, how to move communities that don't want to be moved. Uh, the Birmingham movement, where Dr. King uh, spoke from in this letter, uh, had begun almost five months earlier uh, in late 1962, when Dr. King reflected that it took almost 20,000 soldiers to get the first Black student enrolled at the University of Mississippi, uh, James Meredith, toward the end of 1962. And he said, the forces that are opposing us are taking risks and organizing more rapidly than we are. We have to risk more. And he spent five months um, taking a very self-consciously big leap. Uh, he, he had to keep it secret from his father because he knew his father would be against it to go in and, and try to mount a massive community organized movement in which he was leading things. Always he'd been uh, responding to local movements and going into something already underway. This one he planned and recruited people and trained people in nonviolence and in demonstrations uh, for months uh, to take this risk because he saw, as he put it, the window in history was closing. So he did five months of community organizing before they even started. And the important thing to remember is that the, all those plans didn't fizzled. It didn't work. It was geared to be um, 20 people going to jail every day uh, and build as, as public support and public recognition uh, caused people to build. Instead, rumors of terrible things happening in that jail um, meant that by the sixth or seventh day, they, were, they could only get four people. They'd been training hundreds for months. And Dr. King himself had to go to jail um, after a ferocious argument within his inner circle. Uh, and he went to jail. And I think another point to, because the community organizing plans didn't work out, which is one of the first rules of community organizing, is that you've got to be, you've got to be ready to, to adapt on the move. And his way of adapting was to write this letter. It's important to recognize it was written with no reading materials. He wasn't even supposed to have a pen. He wasn't supposed to have the newspaper in which he saw the story, but it was smuggled in by Clarence Jones, who still lives out in Cal California as his lawyer. He was the only person allowed to see him. And he only had a little slit in the, in the roof. You can go to Birmingham today and see it. Very little light. He had to put it in. And he started writing the letter around the margins of the newspaper to address 
uh, these people. His staff thought he had lost his mind because he had a movement that was struggling to stay afloat, to raise money, to get people out of jail, uh, to petition the White House, to do a hundred things. And all he wanted to do was write this letter to these white preachers. And his staff kept saying, Dr. King has lost his mind. He's lost his sense of balance. But he was really fixated on, on, on this letter. And you see tremendous um, variation in the letter, in the voice that he speaks. Um, at the end, that 300 word sentence about waiting and his daughter and his son, uh, and he winds up saying, uh, denouncing people who paternalistically set the timetable for another person's freedom. There's rage coming out of there. But when it starts off, he's talking about, I came across, I mean, he's in solitary. He says, I came across it and I, I don't answer things that come across my desk. He sounds like a very casual um, big shot. And so the real question there is, what voice is he, does he assume that the movement is going to fall apart, which is what was happening, or does he really think he can change things by writing these people? And that is the great lesson, the great question, I think, um, in the letter from Birmingham jail. But where I would close it, um, because we're going to hear the rest of it, is to prepare people for the notion that the letter from the Birmingham jail changed nothing. Nobody paid any attention to it. It was not going to be published. There was no news about it. When Dr. King came out of jail on, on April 20th, having been in jail for eight days, President Kennedy held a press conference four days later. He wouldn't even ask a question about Birmingham, the jail, Dr. King's letter, any of it. It, it, it did not register in the country. Something else had to make it register, more community organizing um, on the other side of this letter. Um, so uh, in a way, the letter is a midpoint between two efforts, two major efforts in community organizing. The second one uh, became historic. And because of that, we're paying attention to this letter for the overall framework that it gives for community struggle about, about equal citizenship where race is involved. So the just for context for the for the rest of us the the letter didn't make a splash when it was initially written but then it was later published in the atlantic is that in in august is it, it that was right published, yeah in august but remember yeah. it was in, in april in april mm -hmm. the world changed between august and april um uh, because of birmingham we can discuss that on the on the other side of the uh, of the second part second of the half. letter mm -hmm. which is really how, how you see it happen but the only uh, there was a Quaker journal in in Philadelphia that expressed some interest in the letter before um, all hell broke loose in Birmingham, which was in May, um, and that's a result of community organizing um, uh, at a at a different level, and really was the greatest risk of Dr. King's career um, uh, in the children's marches that that really opened up Birmingham and and caused it to be noticed by people all around the world and to ask the question, what was going on in Birmingham? And to answer that question, the letter was there. So the letter was rediscovered ex post facto to help people understand how this great emotional upheaval uh, uh, occurred after the letter was written. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, actually, there are a couple that I think are better served after we hear the rest of the letter. Um, but I am going to just pose this one, which I think is, well, I think it's for anyone though. I think it maybe is directed at um, Pastor Tara or Trey. Um, the question from Allison Lynch, uh, what kinds of work would you like to see white people do to help in the struggle? Um, a group, this, the audience member is saying a group I'm a part of is asking this question. How can we show up? What can we do in the workplace, schools, churches and synagogues, et cetera, to be in the movement? I think that's a huge question and we only have a few minutes, but grounding it in the letter, um, I'm, I, I guess what I'm, my spin on this question is, um, what would solidarity have looked like in that moment that we can possibly then in, uh, iterate from? Because uh, in the moment, clearly the this is in politic. This is it's not timely. Was was not solidarity uh, from Dr. King's white colleagues. So what would that have looked like then? So that maybe we can start to iterate. 
So this is uh, Pastor Tara. Um, a couple of things come to mind. One is that solidarity would have been would have looked like the, re the that letter not the op-ed that was published not being written and published in the first place, um, or uh, barring you know not being able to stop those gentlemen from writing the letter uh, writing that op-ed. There would have been an op-ed in answer to that op-ed, right? So we didn't see the uh, Dr. King's letter until August, but there would have been an op-ed coming from other white clergymen, right? Calling out and challenging uh, the first op-ed and standing in solidarity with Dr. King. Um, uh, there is, a, um, there is a, a healthy debate and by healthy, I mean robust um, debate within a lot of communities of color in particular black communities about the role of, of white folk if I just be a little colloquial for a minute, um, in the movement for Black Lives, um, there are some who uh, argue that, you know, white should come alongside of, right, be present, be seen with us, be right there beside us while we're marching. Um, there are others who posit that actually go get your people. <laughs> like, I don't need you to stand beside me in the march or the protest. I do need you to go talk to your people. Go talk to other white people right, and educate them and challenge them and confront them, right? You don't even have to do it publicly, but while you're sitting at the dinner table, when you're in your own workplace, when you're at the family gathering, like, what are you saying? What are you doing, you know, vis-a-vis -vis other people who are positioned the same as you, who are privileged um, because of their whiteness? What's the conversation between y'all sound like? Because if you stand in solidarity with me when you're with me, but you're not challenging, you're not educating, you're not pushing back against other folks um, who are privileged because of their whiteness when you're with them, then what, you know, you're, you're talking, I don't want to say talking at both sides of your mouth, but you're, it's um, the, the white supremacy and white dominant culture is being reinforced because it's not being challenged. Um, and so I think that solidarity then and solidarity now means not just owning up Yes, it's, 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 it's enough to own up to the fact that you're white, that you have white skin privilege and what that means at both an individual level as well as an institutional level as well as a systemic level. So that is one level of awareness. Um, and it takes a lot to even come to that level of awareness. Um, but then the second level, um, if you want to move into solidarity, then it is about not just aligning yourself with other people who don't look like you, but what does the conversation look like? How are you conducting yourself? What are you saying when you're around people who do look like you? What's that conversation look like? Beautiful, that's gorgeous, thank you. Um, I think that I, I wanna lift up the fact that what Pastor Tara has just said too, it does not involve like giant uh, gestures in public. Um, so thank you for that. And with that, um, I'm gonna, get us, um, we're, we're going to take the opportunity to hear the rest of the letter from a Birmingham jail, this time delivered by another Baltimore School for the Arts student, uh, Joseph Hatchett II. Um, so Matan, whenever you are ready. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in the public schools, it is rather strange and paradoxical to find us consciously breaking laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine when a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in internal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. 
All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. To use the words of Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher, segregation substitutes an I-it relationship for the I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. So segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, but it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. Isn't segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, an expression of his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? So I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court because it is morally right. And I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances because they are morally wrong. There are some instances when a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I was arrested Friday on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, there's nothing wrong with an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade. But when the ordinance is used to preserve segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, then it becomes unjust. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was seen sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar because a higher moral law was involved. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks before submitting to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. We can never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. But I am sure that if I had lived in Germany during that time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers even though it was illegal. If I lived in a communist country today where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I believe I would openly advocate disobeying these anti-religious laws. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block and the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in in the goal you seek, but I, I can't agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of good will is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had almost hoped that the white moderate would reject the myth of time, I received a letter this morning from a white brother in Texas which said, all Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, but is it possible that you are in too great of a religious hurry? It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. All that is said here grows out of a tragic misconception of time. It is strangely the irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. I am coming to feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. We must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. 
Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge for freedom will eventually come. This is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. Something without has reminded him that he can gain it. Consciously and unconsciously, he has been swept in by what the Germans call the zeitgeist, and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, he is moving with a sense of cosmic urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. Recognizing this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand public demonstrations. The Negro has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations. He has to get them out, so let him march sometime. Let him have his prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Understand why he must have sit-ins and freedom rides. If his repressed emotions do not come out in these nonviolent ways, they will come out in ominous expressions of violence. This is not a threat. It is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. But I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled through the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. Now this approach is being dismissed as extremist. I must admit that I was initially disappointed in being so categorized. But as I continue to think about the matter, I gradually gained a bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. Was not Jesus an extremist in love? Love your enemies. Bless them that cursed you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus Christ? I bear in my body to the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Was not John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a mockery of my conscience. Was not Abraham Lincoln an extremist? This nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Was not Thomas Jefferson an extremist? We would hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? I had hoped that the white martyr would see this. Maybe I was too optimistic. Maybe I expected too much. I guess I should have realized that few members of a race that has oppressed another race can understand or appreciate the deep groans and passionate yearnings of those that have been oppressed. And still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. I had the strange feeling when I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery several years ago that we would have the support of the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be some of our strongest allies. Instead, some few have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dreams of the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern serve as the channel through which our just grievances would get to the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand, but again, I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with the desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow this decree because integration is morally right and that the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churches stand on the sidelines and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial economic justice, I have heard so many ministers say, those are social issues which the gospel has nothing to do with. 
And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which made a strange distinction between bodies and souls, the sacred and the secular. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. I meet young people every day whose disappointment with the church has risen to outright disgust. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are presently misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson scratched across the pages of history, the majestic word of the Declaration of Independence, we were here. For more than two centuries, our foreparents labored here without wages. They made cotton king, and they built the homes of their masters in the midst of brutal injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet out of a bottomless vitality, our people continue to thrive and develop if the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the oppression we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the internal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. I must close now, but before closing, I am impelled to mention one other point in your statement that troubled me profoundly. You warmingly commended the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I do not believe you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen its angry, violent dogs literally biting six unarmed, nonviolent Negroes. I do not believe you would so quickly commend the policemen if you would observe their ugly and inhumane treatment of Negroes in the city jail. If you would watch them push and curse old Negro women and young Negro girls. If you would see them slap and kick old, young, old Negro men and young boys. If you would observe them, as they did on two occasions, refusing to give us food because we wanted to sing our grace together. I'm sorry I cannot join you in your praise for the police department. It is true that they have been rather disciplined in their public handling of the demonstrators. In this sense, they have been publicly nonviolent. But for what purpose? to preserve the evil system of segregation. Over the last few years, I have consistently preached that nonviolence demands that the means we use must be pure as the ends we seek. So I have tried to make it clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends. But now I must affirm that it is just as wrong or even more to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. I wish you had commended the Negro demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of the most inhuman provocation. One day the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be the James Merediths, courageously and with a majestic sense of purpose facing jeering and hostile mobs and the agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. They will be old, oppressed, battered Negro women, symbolized in a 72-year-old woman of Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with a sense of dignity and with her people decided not to ride the segregated buses, and responded to one who inquired about her tiredness with ungrammatical profundity, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. 
They will be young high school and college students, young ministers of the gospel, and a host of their elders courageously and nonviolently sitting in at lunch counters and willingly going to jail for conscience sake. One day the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and the most sacred values of our Judeo-Christian heritage. If I have said anything in this letter that is an understatement of the truth and is indicative of unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything in this letter that is an overstatement of the truth and is indicative of my having a patience that makes me patient with anything less than my brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood. Martin Luther King Jr. Ooh. Wow. Um, I just want to hold for all of us um, the gratitude for uh, Joseph and Hayden, those two young people from the Baltimore School for the Arts. That was remarkable. So now we've heard the letter almost it's in its entirety. There's, I think, two, two or three paragraphs um, that were excised for time's sake. Um, and I, I, we have a lot to talk about, I think, <laughs> and not a whole lot of time. Um, in this go round, Taylor, I'm going to start with you. Um, King expressed political activism in this letter as stemming from both secular and spiritual roots, um, often joining the sacred and the secular in paired phrasing. For instance, we just heard the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, stop us. The opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Why, Taylor, is King citing the heritage of a country born in slavery? That is a great question, and it's a particularly pertinent question to ask right now when our country is on the cusp of losing faith in elections. Dr. King recognized, and he mentioned the founders there. He always put one foot in the Constitution and the other foot in the scriptures in a very, very parallel way. He realized that even though the Constitution was formed largely by slaveholders, they were trying to figure out how to stop white people from slaughtering each other as the only way that people knew how to organize politics. Every king is the result of a war. Um, dynastic wars and, and coups and slaughter on the order of the king are still the, the rule of the day in most of the countries on earth. So Dr. King recognized that in addition to the sacred heritage that he was appealing to, that the promise of a republic where you do things by votes rather than by your armies uh, holds promise for Black people too. That's why he saw nonviolence not just, as an, not just as a method only for Black people um, because of Gandhi, uh, not just something for vegetarians and oddballs. He said anybody who believes in democracy believes in nonviolence because democracy is nothing but votes instead of war and, and militias and you know, guillotine squads, which is what they had in the French Revolution uh, that was inspired by the American Revolution but ran off the rails. Uh, it's hard to really live up to the belief that we can self-govern ourselves and build trust through votes to accomplish good things together. I think Dr. King recognized that that was a resource that he had to appeal to. The, the founding creed of American, we the people, uh, did not overtly exclude uh, Black people, even though you know, they didn't uh, intend for women to vote at the time, but they still wrote, we the people of the United States, you know, you know, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, and all those other amazing things. So uh, he deliberately chose, and I think it's one of the most significant things about his messaging, to emphasize spiritual roots and democratic uh, norms, what I call equal votes and equal souls, uh, equally. And um, uh, that's what he did in closing the letter. I, there are two or three other examples in the letter of the same thing. So uh, repeatedly, he kept using those paired phrases. Indeed, yes. Um, 
And Pastor Tara, I'm going to turn to you as a pastor and a lawyer. I would love to hear your thoughts about this twinning that um, Taylor and I have just been uh, talking about. Can you, does it resonate for you? Um, can you talk about the connection between your change making work and your spiritual practice, if you're willing? You're muted. Tara. You're muted, Pastor Tara. I'm sorry. I thought I had unmuted myself. Um, so I think Dr. King, and not him exclusively, um, but since we're focused on him and his letter today, I think that he was very masterful. I think he learned how to be very masterful at appealing to spirit as well as mind and soul at the same time. Um, he understood who his audience was at any particular time. And he made an effort to speak to that audience um, and to speak to that audience in terms that they would understand. Um, I don't find him to be mealy mouthed at all. Um, I don't find him to be solicitous at all. I find him to be strategic at understanding who am I talking to at this particular time and what are the words, what are the phrases, what are the metaphors, analogies, what, what is the history that I can evoke um, to try to get my point across to this particular audience, to the person who'll be reading this letter, to the person who's going to hear this speech or this sermon, um, yeah, you know, to the person I'm going to be sitting across the seat at uh, in the meeting. Um, and 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 I also find truth in his um, speaking to the secular and the spiritual at the same time, because one thing I've come to learn is that. Um, the issues that we have with each other, um, with our politics and with our issues is that we have difficulty moving and walking in complexity and understanding that multiple things can be true at the same time. <laughs> so um, when you talk about the forefathers of this country, it is true that they were fleeing religious persecution and they were seeking a place where they could practice their religion and not have religion imposed upon them in ways that they had suffered under English rule or French, you know, British rule or French rule or other rules. So that is true. And so the argument that America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles, um, there is truth to that. There is truth in that. It is also true that those very same men were slaveholders. Um, uh, they, you know, they were white supremacists who believed, you know, they, they, they wouldn't have called themselves white supremacists, but they believed that whites were supreme to people of color and that people of color weren't even people, they were chattel, slavery, right? Um, and so when they did write We the People, they were not talking about African peoples. They were not talking about the Native Americans, right? They were talking about their own and their kind. And both of those things are true. Um, and because both of those things existed at the same time, you can get this very twisted doctrine that God must have been okay with both of them. And I think Dr. King um, is very masterful at sort of speaking to both truths at the same time, speaking to what you hold to be truth, but then starting to tear down one of those truths um, while still holding on um, and sort of endorsing or advancing um, the other truth. Um, and, and, and I think that that is even, again, bringing it up to present day, I think we see that very present today, which is why my white brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm very much a Christian, you know, I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost, filled, fire baptized, all that good stuff. Why my brothers and sisters in Christ um, can talk about the Judeo principles, right, and, 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 and um, lament and grieve the fact that, you know, America seems to have moved away from, seems to be um, running away from Judeo-Christian principles um, and at the same time be completely blind, utterly, completely blind <laughs> to white privilege and white supremacy and white dominance and anti-Blackness and the way that that continues, um, what, the, the way that is baked into this America, it is baked into this America and um, has continued to define what this America has become. Um, and so 
I think that as Dr. King has done, there are now present day Dr. Kings, there are now present day people, both within and without the church, who are sort of calling that up and calling that out, but it remains very much a tension um, and very much um, a conflict. Um, and it's one that we continue to struggle with, um, struggle with today. But I think it's always important as I, as a minister, when I'm speaking to an audience that is both all Christian or all non-Christian or a mix of the two, I have to be conscious of who I'm speaking to. And I can't just speak to this. I, I can't, um, we have a saying that says, I can't be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. And I think that that's what you see in Dr. King's letter, not just in this writing, but throughout all of his writings and all of his sermons. And he even spoke to it. I don't wanna be so religious and so spiritual that I fail to recognize what is happening in the natural, what is happening in the secular and how those things are integrated and intertwined. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Trey, I wanna give you an opportunity to bring your voice back into the space. Do you have any reactions specifically to you know where we are now or do you wanna take us into a different direction? Yeah, no, well, one, first, uh, uh, Taylor and Pastor Tara just like did a beautiful job at, at summing up the second part of this letter, summing up Dr. King and, 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 and just how masterful he was. Um, you know, there, there, there was a, a, a question um, that, that I know uh, <laughs> we talked about uh, in the planning stages of this panel around, um, you know, what, what, does it, what does it mean, right, specifically uh, for, for um, faith leaders, um, you know, synagogues to be more courageous, right, and cautious. Dr. King had uh, lifted up a specific piece inside of his letter talking about how he felt like white ministers, priests, rabbis, you know, of the South would be some of the strongest allies instead they were opponents, right? Um, and in one particular line also struck me inside of um, the second part of the letter, uh, which was, um, which was uh, the particular piece that said, I had also hoped that the white moderate will reject the miss of time. I received a letter this morning from a white brother in Texas, which said all Christians know that colored people will receive equal rights eventually, eventually. But is it possible that you are in too great of a religious time, right? And so I elevate that particularly to say that, you know, two things. One, it's very easy for people who ain't got to live with the consequences of their actions, right, to be able to say, wait. <laughs> you know, like, you don't have to live with the consequences. As an organizer, I talk about that oftentimes, right? Part of the beauty of organizing for me is that we are responsive to the people who we are charged, right, with helping to develop, helping to, to, to fix the conditions that they exist in. And the first thing that I tell, tell any organizer that I'm in community with is we don't have to live with the consequences of our actions. Therefore, we should not be the, be the sole decision maker, potentially no decision maker at all, right? And that's what I felt like Dr. King was also saying here, you know, to, to these white moderates, right? To these religious leaders, right? You all don't have to live with the consequences of what happened, right? But we do, right? This community does. And so therefore, it's easy for you to say wait, right? Even because you think that you see progress, right? It's easy for you to say wait, but you don't feel the brunt of the injustices that are happening, right? And so that brings me to the particular piece around what does it mean to, to be courageous, right? What does that look like right now? Um, for me, the first is, is, is for anybody listening to me, it's just in your mindset, right? We have to get out of this practice of telling people that there is progress, so you should wait right, for the changes that, that you know you deserve, <laughs> right? Like, like that, that, that is a particular shift in mindset that I oftentimes see um, across the aisle, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, we gave police officers some training, right? It's progress. Therefore, we don't have to talk about, you know, transparency or accountability or any of those like other other particular pieces that, that we know uh, for, for Black people in particular could potentially be a safeguard, right? Some would even argue possibly no police at all, right? You know, like all of these are conversations that are happening where there are people who are saying, well, we have progress, right? Um, people will say, well, Trump is out, Biden is in, 
Democrats are in, not to make this thing partisan, right? But, you know, folks saw Trump as the largest symptom of, of, of I mean, as a, as a symptom of a larger issue uh, with, with the resurgence um, of blatant white supremacy and racism, right, at the highest level of, of political office. Um, and so folks uh, will say, well, this is progress, right? But then when it comes to the massive voter suppression that we see happening across the country, folks will be like, well, let's wait. Right. You know, let's 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 wait, because we, we, we this, this is progress that that the, that the White House has flipped or the Senate has flipped. Right. So that that mindset has to change. Right. Um, the second thing is that and I'll try to speed through this because I definitely want to save time for, for some questions, but that uh, that folks should not be afraid to break laws um, in the civil disobedience way, of course, naturally, uh, that we know are unjust. Right, or that we know what could be a precursor to bringing greater attention to an issue that for some is actually life or death, right? And we have to get out of the mindset of, of, of particularly believing um, that, for example, the highway actions or blocking traffic that, or, or you know, shutting down a business district, that those temporary inconveniences trump. Right, the realities of the fact that that black people in this country are still living in less than humane conditions, right? Um, and so, so that particular thing uh, has to change. Uh, folks have to uh, be willing to talk to their family about the unjust views that they hold. I tell people all the time, it's easy to talk to people that you agree with. <laughs> you know, the challenge is talking to people where you may disagree with, right? And so that's what it means to be courageous, right? being willing to experiment. Oftentimes, you know, there are different and more, you know, quote unquote, progressive views, right? Defund the police is a hot button topic right now, even to this day, right? Where folks are like, I'm not willing to experiment with it, right? But the experimentation of figuring out something new, something different is how we get to a much better system, in my opinion. And then the final thing that I'll say is that, um, which is which is what I believe is the charge for anybody who um, is engaged in movement work, particularly as organizers, is that uh, to be courageous means that we are up to the business of changing hearts and minds. Right? I tell people all the time that it doesn't matter how right you are. I feel like I'm surrounded by some of the brightest and smartest people inside of the world. Right? I think that they're right. I think I'm right. I think I'm on the right side of history. I think that the values that I stand for are right. I think that they're fair. I think that they're just. And I don't think that that's enough, right? I feel like our job is changing hearts and minds. Again, going back to something I said earlier, it is easy to talk to people that you agree with, but the work is to organize those that we don't uh, are not in agreement with or that are on the sidelines, right? For the people who are already in agreement with us, you know, they could be on the right side of history with us, right? But in order to actually create systemic change to fix the conditions that people of color, particularly black people are living in, it requires us to be in the space of organizing people to be in the new majority, right? The new majority, because at the time of the civil rights movement, we gotta remember that it was probably at least at a, at a surface level, a minority opinion that black people should have the right to vote or that they should not be abused by the system or by police, right? And they had to create the new majority, right? They had to create the movement. That is still, to me, the charge of organizing, organizing today and movement builders today is to create the new majority. And that means that we have to be up to the business of changing hearts and minds. Thank you. Um, I know, Taylor, I know you have to run to another obligation at the top of the hour. And so before you go, thank you, Trey, um, I want to, I actually want to address this question to you. Taylor, you, as we were planning for this, you actually posed the ultimate question about the letter from a Birmingham jail as whether or not Dr. King was anticipating doom or triumph for American race relations. And so I wanna pose that question to you. Do you have an answer as to what Dr. King was, um, was anticipating? Oh, Taylor, you're muted. I don't have an answer and I don't think he did either. I think he was um, uh, spiritually and by nature an optimist, but I think uh, Birmingham had proved uh, he, he was no Pollyanna about how deep uh, racial injustice was, and Birmingham uh, made it even worse. 
uh, which is why, I mean, uh, what I'd want to leave people with is when he came out of jail, having written this letter and nobody paid any attention to it, the movement in Birmingham continued to decline to the point of extinction. And the only thing that saved it was that some of the people on his staff said that in our youth sessions, we've got hundreds of young people uh, who are willing to take up the marches where the adults have trickled down to, to almost nothing. And um, word got out that the rumors got out that Dr. King was thinking of sending children to jail and the black adults of Birmingham revolted and came and told him, this is insane, you can't do this. So there was tremendous upheaval within black Birmingham and he finally decided to go ahead and do this. And it, the demonstrations went from 20 people on May 1st to 600 teenagers on May 2nd. And that's when the dogs and the fire hoses came out. That's when the world noticed. And the, and the day after that, there was another thousand. And Dr. King, um, and those kids literally converted their parents. Uh, a lot of the parents were furious. Most, most of them didn't tell their parents they were gonna do it. They did it in defiance of their parents. Um, Freeman Herbowski, who's a retiring now from UMBC here in Baltimore, went to jail as a 12-year-old. He's the only one I've ever found who said he got permission from his parents to go to jail um, in Birmingham on May 3rd, 1963. Um, but this is what opened, broke the dam. This is creative taking a risk beyond anybody's comfort level. Uh, in, in the movement. And it, it's what did create the new majority went all around the world and, and changed everything, including not only the segregation laws, but the uh, equal citizenship affecting women uh, and you know, lots of other groups. Uh, we shouldn't forget since um, because of you as sponsors that one of the people that Dr. King wrote the letter to was Rabbi of Birmingham. Uh, Jews in the South had a hard time just existing uh, as, a, as a minority, and the idea of being right on the race issue uh, put them in a tough position. So uh, Rabbi Gittleson signed on to this letter rebuking Dr. King. And yet after the kids marched, within a few years, I, I don't believe their Judaism had really thought seriously about having female rabbis, but out of the civil rights movement, and the struggle for equal citizenship, we now take female rabbis for granted. And the very first ones were ordained um, in Cleveland, you know, within a few years, and they had been part of the civil rights movement. So movements necessitate risk, deep thought, so that you can ground it, but also taking risks and experiments. And I think that's what um, Trey and Tara have been trying to emphasize, but you can really see it there um, in, in Birmingham um, because the letter really should be read to help us explain what went into the taking of that tremendous risk with the children of Birmingham uh, that, that paid off when nobody really expected it to. Uh, George Wallace condemned it on the right, Bobby Kennedy condemned it in the middle. Malcolm X condemned it, saying, you know, who, who can let children fight their battles? And, and yet it had this paradoxical result. Thank you. Yeah, the whole story of the so-called children's campaign, when I was first reading it about, about it a couple of years ago, just really blew my mind. Kids as young as six. Um, and then the Birmingham city used the trash trucks to move them to the and more girls than boys by by about 15 percent yeah um we are running out of time um i would like to um this is from several questions from the audience i'm going to kind of mash them together into one which is that we've talked a lot about what hasn't changed um together in this in these two panels and in the um in the spirit of moving from strength to strength, um, which um, from Jewish tradition, I would love to hear a little bit, um, a very little bit, because I know Taylor, you have to go um, and Pastor Tara, I know you also have obligations, but if you could share with us sort of what has, what has moved in positive directions that we should be doing more of as a society, as white people, I'm speaking as a white person now, as people of faith, there are many people of faith, Jews and non-Jews on this call today. Um, so what have people been done over the past 60 years that we should be doing more of so that we can move from strength to strength? And that question is for wh whomever would like to jump in. 
So this is Tara, as someone who does not consider herself an organizer um, in the true sense of that word. Um, I think one thing that we've done well and that we need to continue to do more of is organizing. <laughs> um, I cannot um, point to one uh, progressive piece of legislation, policy reform, institutional reform. I can't point to one that did not happen because of organizing. Um, at OSI Baltimore, we often talk about the inside game as well as the outside game. Um, but there's no such thing as an inside game that didn't get as far as it got and there was no outside game going on. You have to have organizing. And I think it is because of organizing um, that we have not only seen the uh, transformations that we've seen since 1963, but I think we've seen them at an accelerated pace um, because communities, particularly of color or communities that are being oppressed in some form or fashion have learned how to organize. They have taken the lessons of the civil rights movement. They have improved upon, they have understood that there is a science. And that's why I do not call myself an organizer because I've come to understand there is a science to organizing. Um, and those who have studied it um, and learned how to do it and do it well, um, I think that we have seen, seen um, accelerated and tremendous progress over the last, what do we have, five decades. Um, and I think that we'll continue, we, we, we will not continue to make progress unless we continue to embrace. And as a former program officer, speaking to people of means and wealth out there and resource organizing, you wanna know where to put your money? How can you help the movement? Resource organizing, resource the organizers, resource the movement, do it with the most flexible dollars possible because that is the beginning, the end, and the middle um, of progress is good organizing. Sorry to steal your thunder, Trey. You have to say something else. So I'm going to actually, um, Taylor, I know you have to go. So thank you. And I am going to give Trey the last word um, here if you would like it. Yes. Yeah, so I'll point to four things and in, 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 uh, pass the time. She, she already precursed, uh, she already teed it up for me. So the first um, is that, you know, what, what have we seen change? You know, we have seen laws shift, right? And shift in, in the right direction, whether they be, um, whether they be laws in, in, the, in the more uh, practical and blatant way, or whether they be cultural laws, right? Things that, that we know may not have been written down in the constitution, but, but was just as acceptable, everything from from uh, from being able to treat you know people as second class citizenship, um, black people as second class citizenship, um, to being able to to just brutalize uh, people, and that may not have been explicitly written in the law, but there was like no recourse to it, right? To Jim Crow laws, right? And segregation and all of those. So we have seen laws actually shift, right? Policies actually shift, uh, and we want we want some 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 good progressive policies policies. We, also, we have also seen a condition shift, right? Some of which has shifted in the right direction. Some of which hasn't, right? So I'm not going to lie and say that, you know, everything is, is, is peaches and cream, but the conditions on the ground in Black communities, right? For example, um, at least before Trump, it was not okay for you to walk inside of a Black community and, you know, call somebody boy or girl, right? Or touch their hair, you know? or be able to, to, to give them a direction and expect that they are just gonna move at the snap of your finger, right? So we saw conditions actually shift, right? And, and, and we've come a long, long way on that. The third um, is that we saw strong organizations be built. And I say strong organizations in the sense of sustainable organizations. You know, one of my biggest beefs with the civil rights movement as much as I've loved MLK and I've loved the movement that was built around him, it was built around one person, right? And so when it came time for, uh, for MLK to unfortunately transition, right, um, be assassinated, uh, there was a vacuum, a leadership vacuum, right, that caused that organization to no longer be strong, the movement to no longer be strong, right? And so all of the gains that was won, to some extent, was rolled back in implementation, right, or just rolled back, period. Right. So now we're seeing right now 
of the movement learn from those lessons and say we're actually going to have a leader full movement, right? And that means that that we have to be able to transition plan. We have to be able to build more folks up. Everything cannot revolve around one person. It has to revolve around a collective, right? All of those particular things. There has to be a movement. And the fourth and final thing uh, in closing is that we we have been seeing at least since 2020, right? Some would, some may argue that it was before that, but I'll, I'll stop at 2020, at least in 2020, we have seen our movement go from protest to power, right? At least temporarily. And so what that means is that for the first time, we saw at a national level, people actually give credit to black political power, right? Or give credit to progressive movements and say that that was part of the deciding or defining factor inside of this country, right? Inside of a national election, we saw the same thing uh, when it came to resources coming in. We also saw the same thing when it came to things like mutual aid, you know, being able to build the alternatives. We're in the position to, to, for the first time, we were able to say a thing and make that thing so, right? So the movement said we needed to take money away from the police and reallocate it you know, just community-based alternatives. And for a brief moment, we saw that thing become so, right? And I have a philosophy that that is what it means to be to have power, right? To be able to set an agenda and have that agenda become true, right? To become actualized. Uh, and we saw that in 2020, briefly, again, briefly, right? But we saw the movement go from protest, right? This reactionary thing to power, a thing that can be flexed, can be tangible, can create the change that we know that we desperately need. So those would be the four things that I would highlight in terms of like what has changed since the civil rights movement. Thank you, Trey. Um, thank you, Pastor Tara. Thank you, Taylor, though he has dropped off. Um, I am now, uh, the panel portion of our program is over. Thank you all for your time and your brilliance. Um, I'm gonna turn it over, I believe to Molly, yes? Um, so Molly Amster uh, is going to share with us some um, organizing work that JUFJ is doing. So Pastor Tara set us up perfectly for that. And um, on, my, on behalf of myself and the folks who organized this program, thank you to all of you who are still with us, stick with us just a little bit longer. It's worth it. Thank you so much, Tracy. I'm Molly Amster. I'm the Maryland Policy Director and Baltimore Director for JUFJ, Jews United for Justice. And we organize Jews and allies in DC and Maryland to help win local, social, racial, and economic justice campaigns that make concrete improvements in people's lives in partnership with organizations led by those who are most directly impacted by the issues that we tackle. I wanna talk to you about, as Dr. King called it, an unjust law. Right now, Maryland statute allows children to be interrogated in custody by police without legal counsel. And we wanna change that because 90% of youth waive their Miranda rights when asked, mainly for lack of understanding or not wanting to admit that they don't understand. Youth also make false confessions at exponentially higher rates than adults. Interrogation without legal counsel for kids exacerbates the racially disparate impact of Maryland's justice system on black and brown people. Deprivation of due process can be particularly dire for minority children who are over-policed. Although youth of all races commit offenses at roughly the same rates, African-American and Latinx youth are arrested at much higher rates than their white counterparts and therefore are at particularly high risk of facing police interrogations and coercion. As a result of false confessions or coerced statements, children face criminal charges, prosecution, and incarceration without basic due process rights that adults are entitled to. As you're likely aware, criminal charges and convictions leave a lasting impact on a person's life, even long after they're no longer involved with the justice system. Failure to ensure that Maryland's youngest residents are safeguarded against unwarranted system involvement is key to breaking institutional cycles of poverty, marginalization, and racism. 
We're working with partners, including Bridge Maryland, Out for Justice, ACLU, Baltimore Action Legal Team, and Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, among others, to pass the Child Interrogation Protection Act, which will require law enforcement to make a good faith effort to notify parents or guardians that their child will be subject to interrogation. A ch um, most importantly, allow a child to consult with an attorney prior to be inter being interrogated and encourage Maryland and courts to adopt age appropriate language for children to understand their rights. Maryland is behind many other states in its protection of due process for children, including our neighbor in Virginia, um, as well as Oklahoma, North Dakota, North Carolina, Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, and California. They all afford youth greater due process protection than we do here in Maryland. Rachel's going to paste a link in the chat to an action alert where you'll be able to fill out a form that will allow you to easily email the leadership of the Maryland General Assembly and your state senator and delegates to urge passage of the Child Interrogation Protection Act. The House of Delegates passed this bill last year, um, and I want to extend a thank you to Delegate Sandy Rosenberg, who's with us today, for voting in support of this legislation last session. But unfortunately, it did not get taken up in the state Senate. We encourage you to edit the subject line and message to make your emails more personal. It will have a much greater impact if you do so. Once you've filled it out, I hope you'll take a bit of extra time to do a, some organizing as Tara encouraged us to do and get five more friends or family members in Maryland to take this action alert uh, and you know to, to pass along the action alert and get them to fill it out as well. Thank you in advance for taking this important action to make Maryland more just. Our kids deserve so much better. I think I'm going to pass it to Jen. Thank you, Molly. And my name is Jen Teslock. I'm the co-chair for the Baltimore Community Building and Education team at Jews United for Justice. Um, we reflected earlier today on what you heard, how that made you feel, and you shared your inward orientation with the first breakout group. We are now gonna ask you to think about what energized you and identify your next step to join us and continue this work. Kiddushin 40B describes a conversation between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva where, about whether study or action was the most important. In the end, they all agree study is greater because it leads to action. We know a lot of folks show up to this event each year, but this work happens on a continuous basis. So we are asking you right now to figure out what your next step is. Dr. King said, if I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. We're not asking you to do great things yet, but we are asking you to do. They can be small things in a great way or small things in a small way to start, as long as you're continuing to engage. We also know that accountability is important. When we make a commitment to others, we are more likely to follow through. You are gonna share what step you are committing to take with your small group. Uh, for those of you here earlier, that will be hopefully the same one as before. Um, and once we put you in small, into breakouts, each person will have one to two minutes to share your commitment. We've put some ideas together to help you get started. We're gonna put a link to our resource sheet in the chat and make it available to folks. There are multiple links right in the document. This resource is not meant to be exhaustive. We identified resources that are tailored for this audience. So I also wanna take a moment. We are gonna put a link in the chat I think we may have done it already. If not, we will um, to talk, to ask you to make sure before the end of today's event that you share with us like how, whether you liked what you have seen today um, and further commit to coming to more events like this. So in, in the next few minutes, um, we are gonna read, you know, we're gonna ask you to read through the options or create your own. 
and see which of these action steps seem like a good fit for you. Once you've identified your next step, we had you pull out a pen and paper earlier or use a note-taking app, um, please pull those back out so that you can identify your next step and prepare to share with your small group. We're gonna play music for one moment to allow you to look through the resources sheet and then I will start the breakout rooms. Welcome back. Um, I hope you are um, feeling as filled up and inspired as I am after such an empowering and inspiring afternoon. Um, I wanna thank um, the students from the Baltimore School of Arts, Pastor Tara Huffman, Taylor Branch, Trey Murphy, Tracy Guy Decker, Rabbi Andy Bush, and the amazing staff and volunteers of JUFJ who made this event possible. Um, if you have been personally organized by someone at JUFJ, will you raise your hand? Someone's been like, oh, we should talk. I have an idea, something you could plug into. Thank you to the amazing crew at JUFJ. Tonight welcomes in to Bishvat, the new year for the trees. We mark the restarting of growth when the sap rises in the trees to begin this process of growth still deep in winter. It reminds us that below the surface, change is happening. Let us awaken to this call of the new year for the trees to let, to let the crystallized sap within us transform and blossom forward. Perhaps today in this program, you felt that sap moving, transforming how you see your role in this work of racial justice and of destroying white supremacy in our own hearts and communities. So let this new year, like every new year, remind us that this work is not conceptual or distant, but it is deeply personal and an obligation on all of us. As we close, I wanna humbly speak directly to the white skinned Jews and white non-Jews in our extended community all of us who gathered here today to receive the wisdom of Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail and the amazing panelists and teachers who expanded on that wisdom. Let us make no mistake. The danger of well-meaning white people discussed in the letter is a danger we are all responsible for. It is upon us in every generation to become co-conspirators with our siblings of color for racial justice with our family members, community members, teachers, and leaders and neighbors of color, and for ourselves. We must interrogate how the danger of the white moderate rises up in ourselves and in our communities. When our hearts are breaking for our Jewish kin under attack this past Shabbat in Texas, and we find ourselves looking to our neighbors for support and solidarity, Dr. King reminded us, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Let that inspire our solidarity action. When we feel exhausted from another conversation about racial justice, Dr. King writes, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride towards freedom is not the white citizens counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. When we lament the destruction of property with greater grief or attention than we give to the destruction of black life, Dr. King reminds us, you deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. And when we arm more police in our Jewish institutions, because it makes us, us feel safer, making it clear white safety is a priority over the safety of people of color and Jews of color in our community, Dr. King wrote, you warmly commended the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I don't believe you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen the angry, violent dogs biting six unarmed, nonviolent Negroes. 
I don't believe you would so quickly commend the policemen if you would observe their ugly and inhumane treatment. Dr. King's letter and the wisdom shared today is the definition of tochacha, sacred rebuke. We will have to repent in this generation, he writes, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. And as Pastor Huffman just said this afternoon, white supremacist culture is being reinforced because it is not being challenged. As we allow the sounds and words of this letter and these teachings to open our hearts, may we commit to a transformation and action this day, this month, this year. What an incredible opportunity. King here at Sown, so may it be that we are inspired to listen, to learn, and to act. I will invite you on behalf of those righteous organizers at JOFJ to please fill out the commitment card and feedback form that's being pasted in the chat to let us know what you appreciated about today's program and what you suggest to improve future offerings and what you intend to do to take action on the inspiration you got from today's program. Thank you once again for dedicating the time and heart space for being here. Thank you, Rabbi Ariana. With that, we'll play some closeout music as you fill out your commitment cards. Thank you for joining us this afternoon.